Our lunch and keynote uh, is Steve Motemeyer. Um, Steve is also part of our steering committee and has been an important uh, voice of innovation uh, and uh, ideas as we've thought about all the things we're working on at Tacoma, uh, Water Partners of Tacoma. Uh, and uh, we wanted to make sure that you all had a chance uh, to hear from Steve um, about some of the work he's doing. Um, he, uh, as you may know, is the uh, principal uh, with, of sustainable development with Collins Warman, a consulting firm. He has more than 22 years experience leading governments, landowners, and project teams toward increased sustainability. He specializes in creating tools and policies that lead to resilient infrastructure systems and, uh, for neighborhoods, cities, and new town developments. And that resilience word is one I think we, we have indeed heard a couple of times during the course of today. And I think a big part of our future is around this question of resilience. So we're really pleased uh, that Steve's able uh, to join us here today. And with that, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Steve Motemeyer. Well, thank you so much. I really am glad to be here. Um, I have a, I'm on the tail end of a cold, so hopefully I won't uh, break into a coughing fit. If I do, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the title that I have here is Emerging Best, Best Practice, and in part that comes from uh, what, what I've found in the last few years. Um, as Bruce mentioned, I, I'm a principal at an architecture and planning firm in Seattle. Uh, however, my background is with uh, a suburb of Tacoma and Seattle Public Utilities. I worked for them for about 12 years in the director's office on water issues, and then I worked for two years for the land use department at the city, looking at how sustainability and land use can come together, and, and, and particularly around how capital spending of a city can start regularly delivering more sustainable outcomes. And then about four years ago, before the economy went over the cliff, I thought, well, maybe I'll try my hand at consulting. And so why, leave, why have a safe job of government when I could be out there scrambling with everyone else? which I did, and uh, I've uh, really enjoyed it. I really lucked out. Uh, one of my first clients was the International Water Association, and they're based in The Hague, Netherlands, and they hired me uh, based on the work that Paul Brown had done. They hired me to help them launch their global program called Cities of the Future, and that was a great gig for me. Uh, uh, it, it, helped, it basically got me some amazing uh, frequent flyer miles, got to go all around the world and look at who's doing the best projects around the world, that are, that are around really sustainability and the issues that cities face. So that was, that those several years of work that I've done on Cities of the Future and getting to travel the globe has really kind of opened up my eyes to a number of issues and I wanted to share with you what those are. And many of them you're hearing already here from Tacoma, some maybe not, but I just wanted to share those with you briefly. So, um, as I mentioned, Paul Brown started uh, the Cities of the Future work along with Vladimir Novotny. And they really looked at you know projects that where it all came together. And uh, this is a key chart here. The uh, this this is the growth global growth. And uh, you know we're about in 2006 billion. We're now at seven billion people. We're going to be up to about 10 billion. And as you know, in the water world at least, um, the, there are billions of people who don't have uh, adequate uh, sanitary water. They don't. There's a billion at least who don't have good drinking water. Population growth is mostly in the under, oops, mostly in these, in the, uh, this is the developed world that we're used to. This is the under, you know, the uh, developing regions. So there's a huge amount of growth. In fact, about 800,000 people a week are moving into cities worldwide every week for the next 40 years. Two thirds of Asia has not yet been built. So we're going to be, as a planet, building immense uh, numbers of cities. And, uh, and what's the kind of t technologies that we're going to use that will be reflective of the times we're in? The times we're in include that we have climate change, uh, changing the way that weather works, that we're going to have resource constraints for energy and food and other things that, as this population peaks, and that we really are going to have technological shifts that are going to, get, are going to kind of compel us into new, new, new and newer sorts of technologies. It's a, a time of vast change. So one of the insights that came from this work and looking at, at folks around the world, what they're doing is really the idea about resilience. And this uh, very groovy chart um, is, is uh, part of that story. 
when you think about the way nature works, if you uh, go and you uh, disturb an area, uh, there will be, uh, you know, a, the, the vegetation will reestablish and it'll grow and then at some point you'll have a very mature system. As systems get more mature, they can get more brittle. And their ability to, uh, to change or accommodate change can, can, can lessen. And the change can either come from within or, or can be conditions behind them change and anyway, they get more brittle. Well, what happens in nature is that every system goes through this conservation phase and then at some point there's a release. You could say that our current recession was one of those releases where there's a failure, where, where resources are re-scrambled and, and re-let out to the environment. If it's a resilient system, it starts reorganizing. And then if it's uh, truly resilient, then it starts this very great virtual cycle here of the exploitation and conservation. This exploitation conservation curve is called the Chamber of Commerce curve. Because it's what, what, we're all, what most of us are all about. We want to find and create jobs and keep them going as long as possible. And that's a good thing. We want that to be as long as possible and the party to last as long as we can. But we have to recognize that every system, human and natural, social and physical, goes through this cycle. And there are times when you get the release of resources and you reorg reorganize. If you're resilient, this Chamber of Commerce curve is long, this release and reorganization phase is short. So how do you make sure that your system is resilient? And that's by shortening that, that cycle. And the way that you can shorten that cycle is thinking about, thinking about it when you're up here in the happy days. So being conscious about that we are really, to sustain through time, to really be sustainable, we have to have, create cities and organizations that can make it through thick and thin, that know how to thrive and come back and keep their identity through all sorts of change. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, with population growth, with technology change, with climate change, we are in, in for a time of a lot of, a lot of change. To be resilient to that, we need to be thinking about the ways that we design our cities, the way we design our infrastructure, the kinds of investments that we make to make our cities really resilient. So that was one of the key lessons that I got from uh, uh, visiting all these great projects around the world, which I'll share some of them with you in a minute. And uh, this, we heard this from Dan, uh, really in the emerging best practice, what, what we're seeing the best projects is, is that we are turning wastewater plants into water, energy, and resource recovery factories. And we already heard that this is going on. This is going to accelerate. And there really is no reason, given the energy that is going in, the calories of energy that go into wastewater treatment plants, that they all, at some point in the next 5, 10, or 20 years, will be self-sustaining and, in fact, providing more energy out than they, than they, 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 now, uh, than they do now. For instance, I think in King County, uh, Seattle City Light's fifth largest customer is the King County Wastewater System. So they're very big energy users now. There's no reason that they can in the next generation shift over to where they're energy exporters. Uh, Paul Brown had mentioned this before. We need to recognize that all water is good, or what they call in Australia, fit for purpose. That really depends on the quality of the water. There's lots of ways that it can be used. And we don't need to, as Paul suggested, bring it in, pollute it, and then get rid of it. We can really start thinking at a much more uh, distributed scale about how we use water. One of the biggest expenses, not the biggest, but one of the biggest ones, is the distribution systems. So if you do water reuse at the wastewater treatment plant, then you've got to run a whole new set of pipes back out to all the buildings, and that can cost a lot of money. In fact, that can make it so that your, your reuse system really isn't as practical as it could be. If you can reuse the water in the building, then you can actually don't have to pay those distribution costs, and then you can be much more cost effective. So looking at a range of scales, and looking at the ways that we can use and reuse water, closing the loops, as Paul said, that's a key part of uh, this emerging best practice. So again, here's another key concept that came out of this whole resilience and looking at, at the way that our cities develop. Now, we all know about green buildings like the LEED Platinum Water Center across the, across the, uh, the harbor there. Um, these buildings like that, green pla uh, these lead platinum buildings, they use natural daylight for lighting, they, they reuse water, that one's got rainwater harvesting, so they use that for non-potable uses. They minimize their energy use, they close loops a lot, they soak water in instead of let it run off, polluted. Well, that same idea actually can apply at the district scale. You can have a whole neighborhood that operates that way. You can have green buildings 
that lower their demand on the centralized systems. You can have neighborhoods that by working together, those buildings can again lower their demand on the centralized systems. So if you think about the whole city with its backbone, infrastructure, water, energy, and transportation, we want those to be there. They're part of the cities of the future, but within, within neighborhoods, districts, we can actually start having uh, re slightly redundant but green systems that create resilience. So at each scale, building, neighborhood, city, we can have systems that interoperate together. So for example, if there's a big earthquake and the water system goes down, if you have a district water system with closed loops, it'll be much easier to supply those thousands of people that live in that district because they'll have their own system that's actually attuned to their needs. If a green building uh, system breaks, you can just plug into the district system. If the district system breaks, you can pull from the green buildings and, put, and from the centralized system. So these layers of, of thinking about how we develop systems builds resilience. And I have a, an example here ahead that proves that it's also less expensive than doing it the way we do it now. So it's not only a good idea, it's actually an economically good idea. Another concept we're talking about, calling it different things, big data. Uh, basically, we, have, we, we now have the capacity with the cloud and with the computing uh, power of the planet to really start running these districts or even a whole city with a very smart system, which is basically an array of sensors that tell what's going on and, then, and actively self-regulate the buildings. So they're much more efficient than we would be when we come in, turn on something and turn it off. They can sense how we're using the system. And this can apply not only to buildings, but to traffic and parking and water supply and wastewater and stormwater. All of these systems can be run. This is a picture of Songdo, which is a suburb of uh, Seoul, Korea. It's going to have, I think, about 25 to 50,000 people. It's totally being wired. It's going to be a total um, smart, self-regulating city. Cisco is one of the key financiers and participants in this. So these smart city systems are coming. In the next 5, 10, and 20 years, we're going to have smarter and smarter infrastructure running our cities. And then uh, uh, based on uh, John Stark's work, or not based on it, but you know, reflecting his work, is the idea that we can start managing stormwater by the way we design the city itself, by having more landscape and making sure that that landscape is working. So the green stormwater infrastructure uh, is, is a key to that. If you think about it, everywhere that somebody has some soil in the city of Tacoma, they could be participating in cleaning up the water of the city. It doesn't just have to be that we clean the pipes. It could also be that everybody could be participating. It, it can move from a utility function to a community function, and, and by then we'll do a whole lot better about cleaning up things like uh, the, the local bay or Puget Sound itself. We really need to move forward with his kind of research and implement it where it's second nature. It's what we do when we live in a place. These are the kinds of things we do. Make sure our stormwater goes through our soil before it goes anywhere else, and then we'll have a huge impact on things like uh, saving Puget Sound. This is, of course, something you're very familiar with, and this photo is from um, Stockholm, uh, but it's um, Hammerby Sjöstad, which is an industrial brownfield area that they redeveloped and made into an inner city, uh, highly uh, sustainable community. They did this in the 90s, and uh, they kept the infrastructure, the cranes, for kind of their art, artistic value, and they put residential right next door. But what they did was they took an area, just like Tacoma's done, where the community had its back to the water and it made it the front door. So you've done that with uh, the Alberts Mill development and the, the Dock Street Marinas where you're cleaning up the FOSS. These are the kinds of strategies that cities of the future do it's with what's what you're doing. This is another key thing is that we're human beings and we're not machines, we're emotional. And creating emotional connections between people and place is something that we can do accidentally or we can actually do with some forethought. And uh, it, when, you're, so when we're designing places, when we're spending millions on infrastructure, we can spend it in a way that actually builds an emotional connection with the community that's paying for it. If you build a, a gray pipe underground and nobody ever sees it, it's gonna, I'm not going to get super sentimental about it. Uh, although I know so many engineers, the city would be. <laughs> and they like them too because they do just what they're supposed to do. Uh, but when you uh, build that green infrastructure, you actually start creating beauty and connections between people and nature and their utility. And you start getting multiple benefits for the same kinds of investments. So someone had mentioned asset management. Asset management is looking at how are we spending our resources to maintain, maintain our infrastructure. 
we can get more benefit, more return on investment if we think more broadly about and actually include those triple bottom line um, economics that include not only does how does it affect the environment and the economics, but how does it help build the community and then build an re emotional relationship between people and place. This was a project in outside of London done by Atelier Dreisaitl, which is a German design firm. They wanted to build this factory. There's a thousand people in this factory. They build race cars here. There, there was zero runoff was the only, you know, was the constraint that they had. You can have, you can build your factory, but no runoff. So they built this system, and you can see this little kind of a wetland area up here. This is the infiltration. But they also built this big water system. It's the stormwater and water treatment system as part of the factory. And uh, by doing that, they created this amazingly beautiful place there where the factory looks out on the water. The water helps light the factory. Um, there's the design. And um, that lake is where the, the first uh, treatment happens. Then it goes through some vegetated wetlands. Then it goes into this lake, uh, secondary lake, the more natural lake, where it soaks into the ground. They also link that lake to the cooling system of the building. So this entire factory gets its heating and cooling from this water that trickles over this, this lovely uh, metal perimeter. So inside the factory, you're looking out at this uh, trickling water, but it's actually the HVAC system for the building. So here, they're spending what they would have spent on an HVAC system, which only the HVAC guys love. They're building it in something that actually everybody can appreciate, and it's the same money. It's the same money. It's just a, a more thoughtful way to do it. Another key piece is that we are, most of us in this room, in fact, probably all of us, are experts in something that we've been trained in. We're, and we're trained in silos, and we have governments that operate in silos, and we have regulatory authority that's bounded by those silos. And we have gained hugely by this kind of silo approach because we've been able to, to have incredible invention that's really pushed the whole industrial age uh, into a whole new place. However, there are effects of the silo, which is that we tend to miss stuff that connects it all together in the other direction. So what is it that integrates our silos and makes them all fit together better? And so that's, that's a key piece uh, to where we need to continue to build our strength at the silo, but we also need to honor the horizontal connections between the silos. And one of the ways to do that is to create a curriculum that pulls it all together. And, uh, oh, I had this great graphic, which is that the baby boomers are fading. You know, they are, this is a great picture. It's supposed to be fading out now. Um, we're getting older. You know, we're, it's time the next generations are coming. And so we've all been trained in silos. We need to really create a curriculum where we honor the silos, but also start training people to think how it all knits together. And that's one of the things I think that is more and more going to be important in the future. There's those silos again. Part of that involves that we really need to look at the physical, social, economic, environmental systems, which is often called the triple bottom line. This, this image along the bottom is from uh, uh, the, uh, one of the programs that Paul's company made, which is really modeling the way systems work. And if you look at the bottom left, it's saying, you know, we have all, this, all these, these are, this is a real simple demonstration, but on the left, it shows all these little blocks that are red. Well, these, are, these could be more efficient. And so they keep trying different, uh, adding in different technologies until they get everything to green. So it's a way to test how these new technologies would impact the whole system by using a, a virtual model rather than uh, just going out and testing, which of course you can do that as well. Another key piece is that we really need to recognize that we are changing and we're in a time of change and that we can be better about that. It's not just deal with what's the next problem and deal with it. We can actually be conscious about managing change and there's a whole emerging field called transition management where we can bring that in and make that part of our thinking about how we move ahead. And then of course it really is about taking advantage of the, what nature gives us, the opportunistic, someone said, take advantage of what's already available there. Oh, I think it was Paul Brown, he's talking about you know, using the, going downhill as a way to generate energy, using natural daylight to light the buildings. We, we, it's really this intersection of human and natural processes where we start getting these higher levels of, of uh, resilience. And I should mention this kind of crazy chart behind me this is called the hammer remodel, but it really showed how solid waste, energy, and water all can, they can basically close the loops at this district scale where there's 25,000 people living here. 
So they modeled how these systems interact together, and then they used that as, as the conceptual model that they then built the community around, which is a very nice community. We used that same sort of thing in a project I just finished last year up in Yesser Terrace in Seattle, which is a 32-acre redevelopment of uh, subsidized housing. We looked at the water and energy systems, and we were able to show that by treating the wastewater on site, we could lower costs $300,000 a year than just paying Seattle Public Utilities to, to treat the water. So we could, low, we could actually treat it to a higher level and then reuse it for less money than just paying sewer and water rates. This system nests into the centralized system. It helps remove some of the flows, in fact, 70% of the flows that are driving a combined sewer overflow that's over, that's the city and the county are gonna spend billions of dollars to fix. So a development can actually save itself money and save the region money by treating wastewater on site and reusing it. And it worked out on the energy as well that we were able to use sewer heat recovery so when the wastewater stream goes by, it's at a warmer temperature. You can put heat exchangers in there, pull that energy out, and then use it for a building. We've got a project now that's $200,000 a year they're spending on, this is in Seattle, $200,000 a year they're spending on natural gas. That'll be totally replaced by using the sewer line. So all the heating and cooling in this building will be from the sewer line. And in about eight years, all the equipment will be paid for, and then they'll have a really nice low energy costs because wastewater goes by at a constant temperature all the time. So at Yester Terrace we showed that we could basically do all the thermal energy or 90 percent of the thermal energy, all the hot water and heating and cooling for the buildings for a million square feet of office and 5,000 apartments. We could do 90 percent of all their thermal energy with on-site resources, sewer heat recovery, solar hot water, and geo exchange using the temperature of the earth. And, uh, and do it for roughly the same cost within a one or two percentage points of just buying it from City Light or Puget Sound Energy. And the reason that works is we were looking at the district scale. This is another project in, in Seoul, Korea, where they're using rainwater, and then they actually um, have this a real-time system so that there's three tanks, one for stormwater control, one for emergency firefighting, and one for reuse. And uh, they manage this, these tanks actively so they can watch a storm cell arriving and they have weather stations that automatically manage these systems. So this is kind of the initial version of what's going on now with the Songdo project I mentioned earlier. Here's another one of those charts from Qingdao, China, looking at energy, water, and food, how the loops fit together, and how a community of 5,000 residents can be almost net zero uh, by, by the way that they use energy, water, and food together. Uh, Stockholm Resilience Center, uh, they were re they're redoing their campus. They wanted to really look at how do we add resilience into the way we do the design. Again, there's, this is the loop they had for water. And, they, and they've come up with a very uh, attractive design that provides habitat for people and habitat for natural sy systems in an urban setting. And it's uh, very cost effective. And it's a, a wonderful example of how to do district level development correctly. And then San Francisco is trying to build this Treasure Island development. Um, and they've also are looking at these kind of more of these closed loop systems. This is for the water. And then Marina Barrage, which was mentioned in Singapore, this is turning a saltwater estuary into a freshwater lake, in which to give water security to the nation. And so that project, uh, again, they did a nice job of of, of making a beautiful facility for visitors to uh, be attractive. People are getting married out here, uh, but they'd also help develop, create re real estate development in the downtown core that was otherwise not, not happening. So there's all these great examples out there. Uh, we're doing some of them here. Many of them we're not. Uh, but we all have jobs, or at least we hope we do. And whatever we're doing, we're really busy, and, um, and, and I know this from my years working at the city and as, and as a consultant. We are very busy doing what we need to do now, and do I really have the time to think about how to do that new thing, and, and, and how much energy is it going to take me to do that? I don't, can't even hire a consultant to tell me how to do it because our budgets are constrained. It's really hard to kind of go from what's the idea to how do we do it. And um, there's another one. I'd love to help, but I'm constrained by time and have less help than ever. And I think this is true for, for many people, particularly after this economic challenge we're in. 
And then again, where's the demand? Show me the money. Why would I really do any of those things here? Why would Tacoma do any of these things? And, um, and here's, I guess, my, some of the reasons why I think we would. It's pretty good. Now, I don't know that they've announced this, and I, don't, I haven't talked to them, so I don't know that it's true, but it's a pretty safe bet that wastewater rates will exceed inflation because the cost to maintain and operate these systems and this new plant you're building, these are major investments. It's likely that they will exceed inflation. Stormwater needs are not a met. We're failing really at the Puget Sound level. We are not getting in front of restoring and protecting Puget Sound. We're still failing on that, even though we're spending millions and millions of dollars on lots of good treatments. Because climate change is coming, we're not going to have the weather we've had in the past. We're going to have the weather we've had in the past and every other kind of weather we've never had. We're going to have a lot more climate variability. That's going to mean that we're going to have more urban flooding. We're going to have droughts that scare the heck out of us, and we're going to have more intense storms. All of these things we will pay real money to fix when the time comes. So there's a budget deficit. I mean, there's a, uh, there's a, a IOU in our budgets that comes from the climate variability that we're facing, meaning we don't know what it's going to cost. We don't know what will happen. But it's pretty sure that we're going to have uh, more extreme events to deal with. We also happen to live in a very seismically active zone. And uh, you know, it doesn't take more than a, if like the last earthquake we had in the Squally quake, if it had been 15 to 30 seconds longer, we would have had many, many millions more damage. These are not unusual quakes for us. We're going to be rebuilding our cities. I was at a class last a couple months ago, and I said, how old do you think Tacoma will live to be? And so that's a question for you. How old is Tacoma going to be? Anyone want to venture a guess? How old will it live to be? Well, how much? 45,000? Four to 5,000 years old. That's a good bet. It's now 180, 170. So it's a, this is like a barely a teenager city, right? And it's going to be around for hundreds of years. And the decisions that we make every day either make us more vulnerable, more resilient, or whatever. So we really need to be thinking long term and recognizing that we can be more resilient. And then, as I mentioned before, technology is changing so rapidly that it, whatever we're investing in now, in 10 years, we're going to look back at it and go, is that really what I wanted? So we can actually start designing for recognizing that we're going to unbolt something, and then 10 years later, we're going to rebolt in something else that does it even better. So if we have that as a design ethic, we're going to be making ourselves more resilient and more able to handle the kinds of changes we face. So we spend a lot of money now. A lot of it's on good stuff, but not all of it's on the right stuff. Some of it makes us more vulnerable. Some of it makes us more resilient. And we need to really start thinking in this integrated way so that we're actually making ourselves more resilient every day as we invest our capital dollars and we engage with our community and our stakeholders. So. I think that the Tacoma Water Partnership is a great example of saying we want to learn more about what these alternatives are. We want to get better at this. We want to be a leader. We, we are a leader, and we want to continue to build on that foundation. And we need to get better at understanding how to evaluate these alternatives, whether we do modeling like Paul's program does, or we do some of the economic analysis that's without the modeling. Um, I think that those are key issues. And then finally, Really, I think uh, joining the Water Partners of Tacoma is a key, key uh, commitment that will help Tacoma build on your success and continue to expand and really become a light in uh, the United States. I would just finally close with saying that I didn't have many examples of the United States in those examples that I gave to you. And that's because the United States is not leading. We are not leading on these kinds of issues. It's going on in Asia. It's going on in parts of uh, in Australia in parts of Europe. The United States is a little slow. And uh, as an American, that kind of irritates me. I think we really have the capacity. We do have the capacity. And we have the reasons that we, we really can step up. And I think Tacoma is showing great leadership. And I appreciate the opportunity to participate in it. So, thank you.